shooting girl with an afro. Nicole Moore loses her false eyelashes in a soggy pigeon hide in Cambridgeshire. I mean, it's not a glamorous thing, pigeon shooting, is it? <laughs> Passing the buck. That's what Tom Davis is doing on Dartmoor as the Roebuck season opens, plus he gets to try the new Pulsar Thermion Duo rifle scope. Yeah, we used the Thermion Duo for the first time on an animal and um, it was 133 metres. And animal rights activists are putting lives in danger with their balmy plans for elephants, which make life dangerous for local people. They have to walk to schools for kilometres in the morning while it's still pitch black dark. They always have a risk of walking into an elephant or a lion. We have a competition for you to win one of five pairs of tickets to the Northern Shooting Show, priced at £200 total. David brings you the news on the news stump. And James Marchington has the best hunting and shooting videos in hunting YouTube. Welcome to Field Sports Britain. We are heading out into the rain with Nicole Moore, better known on Instagram as Shooting Girl with an Afro. She's after pigeons on the fens near Peterborough in Cambridgeshire. There was a good line going earlier. Obviously, it's raining a little bit at the moment, so um, but we should be in the right place. I'm going to draw them in, uh, set up my magnet, set up a bit of a pattern, and yeah, see what we can see what we can get out of the sky today. The problem with the fens is that it's very flat. So I haven't got really much cover. Um, I mean, this is the best land that I have in terms of trees, but there's not really any trees. There's not really any hedgerows. There's not any lumps and bumps in the land <laughs> um, that I can use as kind of like a back cover, background cover for myself. So these are Scylla socks, very old, very reliable. There's a bit of a breeze today, so they should do what they're supposed to do. And just easy and light to stick out. You don't always have the birds. I shoot to eat, so even when I've got a load of pigeons, sometimes they've just all been eaten by the time I <laughs> next go out. I forget to save some aside for my patterns. I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm just doing it for fun. And kind of just using my common sense. So let's give it another go. Only 12 volts, he says. <laughs> Hey, she fixed it all by herself. <laughs> right, beautiful. You know, you set up your gear the best way you think, based on where you are, what the birds are doing, the wind, etc., and the weather. Sometimes it works straight away. Sometimes it half works. Sometimes it doesn't work at all, and you've just got to kind of play it by ear. Half an hour into an hour in, if it's not working, I'll come back out. I'll change things up a bit. Um, and see, you know, you've got to be, when you're doing this, you've got to be willing to not be lazy. It's not a, <laughs> it's not a lazy sport, you know. First you've got to carry all the gear here and then you've got to, you've just got to really think about it, you know. You, you can't, it's not one of those things where you can just sit back and wait for them to fall in your lap, you know. You've got to, you've got to think about it, you've got to see what's going on and see where you might have to change things. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we'll see how we get on. <laughs> oh, of course it's carrying on till six. Of course it is. It's changed since I left, mate. Uh, the, oh, oh, oh. oh, lovely. And I got distracted by the lashes falling off. I mean, it's not a glamorous thing, pigeon shooting, is it? <laughs> no, it's not. There's no, po there's no point having glamorous lashes on True. when you're out in this weather. Let's get rid of those. Are they all gone? Uh, I think so. That's better. See, you said you think so. That means you couldn't tell that I was wearing them. Ah. Natural. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. So I'm using Ely's, the Ely Pigeon Select. That's what I always use for pigeon shooting. 32 normally, but I think I got 30 grand because that's all they had at the time. A bit of movement. The only thing with using this gun, obviously, as anyone that uses semi-auto knows, is that obviously as I shoot, the cartridges are going to be flung out a mile. So <laughs> it makes for fun collecting at the end. But I'm a very non-PC person. So for years, you know, working in... Oh, yeah, the wind's definitely changed. Working in kind of offices and things and as a salesperson and as an estate agent, I was always the only black one. Right. Not just the only black girl, the only black face. Yeah. But 
people would quite often forget my name or they'd get it wrong about Nicole. My name's Nicole. They'd call me Michelle, Natalie, Naomi, Nicola. No. So I just said, just ask for the black one. Just ask for the black girl. Nicole, right? Yeah. Just, just say the black girl. It's fine. Because it's the easiest way to identify me. <laughs> you don't have to think. And they'd go, oh, oh OK. Um, and it's the same with the shooting. It's like, you know, just say, you know, the one with the afro. I started saying that, like, you know, I'll ask, ask if I can join you on that shoot. Just say, you know, the one with the afro. And so that's what I thought of the name, shooting girl with an afro, you know. So yeah. just kind of, yeah. yeah. No racism at all in terms of this sport and field sports. Nothing at all. The first surprise is that I'm female. And then some people will then back it up secondly by saying, oh, and you're, you know, and you're black as well. Like, yeah. that, but that's never been the first thing that people have said. You know, it's like, oh, lady gun. Um, or if it's a female, oh, yay, I'm not the only girl. You know, it's always the fact that I'm female first. Um, and it, in fact, if I think of one of the shoots I had a few looks on, um, I, it was more to do with the fact that I didn't understand the etiquette <laughs> on this large, private, very wealthy estate that I was a gun and I wasn't supposed to be talking to the beaters. <laughs> I didn't know anything about it. So um, at lunchtime, I popped on over to the beaters and went, oh, thanks, guys. That was brilliant. I had some great birds there and your dogs are beautiful. And they all just went... <laughs> and I was like, uh, am I not... Uh? And then walked away and spoke to the other guns. And they said, yeah, it's because you're a gun and they're the beaters. And I was like, and? Well, it's like a traditional thing. It's like, oh, oh, it's them and us. OK. I'm in a them and us situation without it being about my colour. Brilliant. Yes. We've shot a couple of pigeons, but it's clear they're feeding on another farmer's newly drilled crop across the river. Nicole decides to pack up and move into the wood, ready for roosting time. It's her favourite type of shooting anyway. Yeah, this is the fun bit. This is like, it's probably my favourite type of shooting, to be fair. So I've got two gaps here, two windows to focus on. We'll see what happens. Ooh. It was lots of fun, very fast birds. I got about half a dozen, um, one of which is stuck up in the tree. I'm going to shake the tree to get it out. I absolutely love it. I, it's, strange to, it's strange to describe the feeling. I love this sound of Harry's running around and just snuffling and I love working with him. I love seeing his excitement. He's as excited as I am to be out here. I just love nature, you know. It's beautiful. I've seen all sorts, you know. You see the sparrowhawks, you see barn owls, you've seen the row in the field, Chinese water deer, and um, there's nothing better than being out in nature, blowing the cobwebs away, getting back home, taking off all your muddy gear, and getting your gym jams on. For more about Ely cartridges, go to elyhawklimited.com. For Jack Pike clothing, see jackpike.co.uk. And to find any of the pigeon shooting kit Nicole is using, head to kitfinder.co.uk. Thank you, Nicole. And welcome to the new members of the Field Sports Nation who signed up since last week, including at the Stalking Show. Join up and you get to watch Field Sports Extra, where we give away prizes. This week, Mike Morris won a dummy launcher from Munjack Trading, priced at more than £130. And we're giving away five pairs of tickets to the Northern Shooting Show, priced at £200. You can join online, you can buy both Northern Shooting Show tickets and Munjack Trading's dummy launcher online too. Links to those below. Next, the man who gives lessons in hair care. It's David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump.
This is Field Sports Channel News. A folk group has released a protest song warning the Scottish Government's proposed fishing ban will devastate coastal communities. Fisherman Angus MacPhail, founder of Celtic band Skippinish, and singer Donald McNeil have released the song, The Clearances Again. It compares the Scottish Government's proposed fishing ban to the Highland Clearances. The song is about plans by ministers to introduce new highly protected marine areas, HPMAs, in 10% of Scottish waters. Supporters of the zones claim they will conserve marine ecosystems while continuing to provide economic and social benefits to those in the fishing industry. During the Highland Clearances in the 18th and 19th centuries, landlords evicted thousands of people from their homes in order to create large farms. Angus MacPhail's brother, Neil, says island residents may be forced to move if the zones are implemented. It was really to raise awareness to the general population the situation we are finding ourselves in currently. Um, there's a terrible, terrible threat to our coastal communities at the moment and the vast majority of the urban population don't realise the, the full implications of what the uh, government policy is, uh, is going to do to these places. YouTube has deleted a popular shooting channel. It took down Vermin Control Scotland, run by Stuart Blair, which put out films about shooting and pest control. Stuart is at a loss as to what YouTube found wrong with the rat shooting video that caused the strike, as it's similar to his other videos. His 6,500 subscribers are finding his new channel and posting their anger on YouTube's decision. There's a link to Stuart's channel below. Please subscribe. I just want to thank you for Sports Britain uh, for the support over the last couple of years. Give me a shout out on Art and YouTube. Trainer Sandy Thompson blames Antis for the death of his horse, Hill 16, which suffered a fatal fall at the Grand National. Protesters attempting to enter the race course and fix themselves to the fences delayed the start by nearly 15 minutes. Sandy's horse fell at the first fence, its first fall in a race, and vets put it down after it suffered a broken neck. The Scottish trainer told the media the horse was hyper due to the protests and blames activists. He told the Racing Post the carry-on was to blame. Meanwhile, BBC TV presenter Chris Packham, who is currently suing Field Sports Channel, is facing calls by the Daily Mail for the BBC to sack him after he urged his followers to join Extinction Rebellion extremists in a four-day protest outside Parliament this weekend, which aims to disrupt the London Marathon. The promise of cash from carbon credits has seen an English company splash millions on land in Scotland. Devon-based Oxygen Conservation bought the land with the help of a £20 million loan from Triodos UK, which calls itself a sustainable bank. Oxygen now owns the Invergeldi estate in Perthshire and 11,000 acres of Langham Moor, which it plans to manage for carbon, including trees and peat. Its purchases are reportedly part funded by the largest commercial debt package in the UK so far, in what newspapers are calling a Scottish green rush. Rural land prices have risen sharply because of payments for carbon credits. The trophy imports ban proposed by MP Henry Smith could devastate taxidermy businesses. Taxidermist Justin Bateman operates his company to Look Alive Wild Art in Mid Wales. He says the proposed legislation, which will have to be approved by the House of Lords before it can become law, could drive his business to the wall, and it doesn't help conservation. Unless there's a monetary value to the animal, it becomes worthless. So if, it, if, if for example, it becomes a pest of farmers and their livestock, or their livelihood, they're, they're more likely to, if they don't have financial recompense for it, for, they're likely to just want it, want on, kill it, the Brecon Beacons is dropping its emblem of a greenhouse gas emitting beacon and changing its name. The National Park in Southern Wales is now to be known as Banai Brecheniog National Park, or informally the Banai. Banai is the plural of ban, which means peak in Welsh, while Brecheniog refers to the kingdom of the 5th century king Brechen, so the name translates into the English as the peaks of Brechen's kingdom. The new logo is more muted and features nods to a king's crown, starry skies, hills and watercourses. Welsh actor Michael Sheen has fronted the rebranding campaign. 
Sweden will say no to the EU's proposal to introduce a lead ban covering nearly all types of ammunition. The country hopes to get more member states on board to be able to stop the proposal. Several Swedish ministers announced that the government wants to stop the recently presented EU proposal for a total ban on lead in ammunition. The government says the proposed exception rules are not sufficient to protect hunting and sport shooting in Sweden and in other European countries with strong hunting and shooting traditions. It says the existing regulation is sufficiently restrictive. The government hopes that other EU countries with strong hunting and shooting traditions will back it. The Swedish Hunters Association welcomes the government's refusal to ban lead. Thanks to Per Helmseth for the story. A New Zealand hunting competition that had been offering a cash prize to the child that shot the most feral cats has been cancelled. The category in the North Canterbury hunting competition was for children aged 14 and under to hunt feral cats, with the most cats by the end of June winning a 250 New Zealand dollar prize. Last year, 250 kids took part in the competition. They were warned that dead microchip cats would disqualify their entire entry. Animal rights campaigners said that disqualifying dead cats with microchips is too little too late, and the competition organisers withdrew the category. Feral and domestic cats are a threat to biodiversity and native wildlife in New Zealand. They eat endangered native birds and eggs, lizards, bats and insects. And finally, is it the end of the world? Black and white foxes have appeared in Wales in the last week. A black fox, thought to be an escaped pet, has been spotted on the back streets of Barry. Meanwhile, fox shooter Dash Sims called in this animal in the Brecon Beacons, also known as Banai, and posted it on Facebook. He didn't shoot it, probably wise. You are now up to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Now, before we get to Roebuck, don't forget to like and subscribe. Likes really count in our battle against the antis, and of course, subscribers make us look good, so don't forget to do that too. The season for Roebuck opened in the UK on the 1st of April, and Tom Davis is out in the woods of Dartmoor, saving saplings. <laughs> Tom Davis is on tree protection duties. He is stalking a wood near where he lives on the edge of Dartmoor and he's looking for roebucks. So it's the 3rd of April, so roebucks are in. So we're hopefully going to try and find some bucks in this humongous woods, <laughs> which, um, yeah, can be hard work. They're hard to find at times, it's such a vast area. But he's clear felled a load of areas, got loads of fresh planting in. So, um, yeah, roebucks now, they're cleaning themselves off velvet. They can be a bit of a pain on the smaller trees and also the tree guards have knocked them over for a pastime. Even though it is the start of the season and the animals have not had stalking pressure for several months, Tom says it can be hard to find them. I tend to find you know, April, May, June, they're very lazy. They just tend to eat, sleep and they you know, just pile on the weight ready for the rut, I find. We have massive areas of woodland, they don't really tend to come out as much um, and all of a sudden during the rut it's just like, oh, there. Now you may not recognise Tom's face because it usually has a thermal spotter in front of it. For his venison business, Tom relies on thermal. After an unusually warm morning, he's finding it hard to use. I think it's just an extremely hot rock. I think I've got one, but it's the sun shining right on that bank, so it could be a rock. It couldn't be in a worse place. <laughs> or a completely still deer <laughs> with his head down. We see one shootable animal, but... So just spotted um, a row on the other side of the valley. Yeah, it's moving down the cliff face and uh, yeah, it's a row doe. Of course, we won't see bucks today. <laughs> After walking the length of the wood, he decides to head out into the surrounding countryside. There is a reason for that. Yeah, we've got fresh spring grass now, so 
tend to be more visible. Farmers, landowners will see them a bit more as well because they'll, you'll see them all times a day because they love that fresh spring grass. We drive to a valley that leads into the big wood. I know of a buck and a doe in this valley. And this leads onto the forestry we've just come out of. And uh, yeah, at the moment I can see a doe out on the bank above the gorse, but the other one's just tucked behind the gorse. It was directly below it. It shows itself, but keeps its head down so we can't see what sex it is. I think we should just hang fire to see if the other one is actually a buck <laughs> before we go down the valley. <laughs> Of course it isn't. The following evening we set out again and Tom drives past one field where it looks like our luck has changed. With that one showing but spooked, he heads to another farm not far from the big wood where there is a buck sunning itself in the late afternoon. Tom hasn't shot this field before so has to ring the farmer who is busy in his tractor within sight of us. The farmer says shoot it and gives Tom the location of another to go and find. Well, I'll go. I'll, I'll shoot this one then and I'll fly up there after. The stalking is quick and easy. Tom swapped out his scope for a new Pulsar Thermion Duo that morning, which gives him daytime digiscope benefits plus an easy switch to thermal. The scope does both, thus the duo in its title. I spotted a roebuck in the field here and I was actually a bit unsure of the, um, the field, to be honest, of uh, if my landowner owned it, so I made a quick call just to make sure, and um, yeah, it's, it's, it's our field too, which is brilliant. Um, it's laid up out the wind, so um, yeah, we used the Thermion Duo for the first time on an animal, and um, it was 133 metres. The Duo doesn't have the option of the rangefinder on it, so I've done that with the Mergers XP50. Uh, that's got the rangefinder on it, which is instant. So I pinged it at that, so I knew the range, and yeah, took the shot with the Duo, um, which was great. I mean, it, I took a video of it, it was, it was nice and clear, I could tell it was a roebuck. You know, using digital or thermal engine scope, as long as you stick to the legal hours, then you're, you know, it's totally legal, which is great, really. And he's had a nice feed already by the looks of things. He was just chilling out. On to the next. <laughs> this is one of my favorite lookout points see about a thousand acres of permission land here. The next deer are exactly where Tom hoped to find them. We had um, three row out in the middle of the field here. Uh, they were 220 meters uh, ranged on the merger. There was two bucks in the doe, so the plan was their homes on the right in the woods. I wanted to shoot the buck on the right first to try and keep the other two out in the field so I could shoot the second buck but it didn't really go to plan. They just ran straight over them on the shot. <laughs> uh, so we got 50%, um, but yeah, we got one out of the two. Tom goes and fetches the carcass. His day is not over though. Around me, there's a lot of people that are lambing now. Literally just today, I've moved some um, targets when I zeroed this in um, and there were some fresh born lambs there as twins. Um, so I'm just doing my rounds now because it's coming up to the end of my deer season now as such, you know, I'm, I'm quieter. So I tend to spend like the next sort of three to four months hitting the foxes extremely hard. So I've got less to do in the winter months. They've got cubs and that's what happens, isn't it? it it's part of it, I'm afraid, yeah. It's just, it, it is how it is. You know, even if it wasn't, you know, my the way I'd have like my routine of doing my foxing, I would still be doing foxing this time of year anyway. So you've got the cubs, you know, the dog foxes, they're hunting hard for the vixens and the cubs. Um, you know, the vixens are still hunting as well. Um, you know, they cause major damage this time of year. It's the prime time of year for fox damage. So, you know, we're all out there doing what we can to stop it. He has a good night foxing too and gets home in the small hours. You can find out more about the Pulsar Thermion duo at thomasjacks.co.uk and Tom's website is dartmoordeerservices.com. Next, from small English deer to Africa's biggest animal. Elephant populations are out of control in some areas, non-existent in others. But don't worry, Africans, for an American animal rights group has found a solution that will only kill a few of you, as Deborah Hadfield finds out. Big, beautiful, but bad neighbours. Elephants in Africa are dangerous to live with. 
Award-winning author Sue Tidwell, who wrote the book Cries of the Savannah, says how destructive they can be. They have to be managed because they eat so much and they cause a lot of damage to water systems and all kinds of things like that. So you have to take an approach, a different approach, for depending on what part of the, the continent you're on. Trophy hunting can never, never cause extinction. In fact, it's an incentive to protect it more. If you look at these communities, remember they live with wildlife on a daily basis. They have to walk to schools for kilometers in the morning while it's still pitch black dark. They always have a risk of walking into an elephant or a lion. So they really put their lives out there, lives on the line, and they've got small areas of acreage of crops that they grow. Um, and if an elephant tramples on that tonight, or a person, they've lost everything, everything they have. One solution, says the International Fund for Animal Welfare, I4, is to allow the animals to migrate. It has come up with a plan, room to roam. The animal rights group wants to create extended elephant corridors in Africa that allow the animals room to move freely. Not just across adjacent borders, but across the length and breadth of nearly half the continent. Hunters and conservationists say it's not practical. The reality of it is there is no, there cannot be a corridor. There are people in between everywhere and the people in Africa can't live with the elephants. Those that do live with the elephants do it on a premise that we can hunt there and we can kind of some, create some sort of a balance where they get protein from it and a compensation for the damage that's done. But if you think about a village living with elephants moving through, it's, it's not ideal. I mean, kids walking to school, uh, you've got to walk through elephants. You know, this, it's not what they want. Um, it's, it's a compromise it's done when we have hunting safaris but in this sort of uh, model that's being looked at I just can't see how it can work. In many areas there are too many elephants and they're driving out other species. In other areas there are too few. Africa once had an estimated 10 million of the animals. Now that number is around a half a million which says the IUCN makes them endangered. Eiffel claims climate change means elephants in some areas of Africa could be threatened with extinction. Firstly, I think it's a misconception and we've got to look at elephants in, in a holistic type of approach. Firstly, there's a difference between managing elephants on a species uh, and managing elephants as a population. A lot of people look at the species and they think that you know, the elephant as a species is endangered, where it's not. Uh, if we ever look at it, populations in southern Africa are really exploding. So elephant populations in the north of Africa where they haven't been protected uh, are in demise. So we, we've got to look at it holistically. Our populations are totally different. Now when we have a look at it and we've got to manage elephant, uh, we see things like the Humane Society coming forward and saying elephants are endangered. Now in South Africa they've come with a project to actually put our elephants onto contraception. So what is it? Are they endangered? And now they protect them from breeding and acting normally? Uh, so it's a bit of contradiction. Our populations grow every year astronomically. We don't have space for elephant. Conservationists say an elephant corridor is not the solution, as the animals seldom travel further than 100 kilometres and they can't read maps. We also know that elephants have their home range and, and when they have moved elephants within Zimbabwe, they move them, and if I understand it's more than 500 kilometres from their home base, they'll typically hang around in that new area. But now we're talking about asking these ones to move. You know, is that something that's practical? How long will it take? Uh, you want them to follow a corridor, but I think they're going to expand this way rather than say, oh, well, let's go, you know, go north. It's, it's not some, I just don't see it practical. If like in Murchison further south of us, um, you removed the elephants like they did just uh, when the Tanzania army moved in uh, to Uganda to oust um, Idi Amin, and uh, the elephant population in Bugungu was decimated by them. What happened was the, um, the terrain closed up uh, without the elephant and uh, the populations of uh, hardebeest and cob and everything dropped off, you know. Bruce's work re-establishing the cob antelope in Uganda, paid for by hunting, is legendary. Conservationists are also concerned that other projects by animal rights organisations have failed because although they look good on paper, they weren't workable. One plan to catch poachers with a camp was quickly abandoned. 
there was no communication on where to put it. Uh, this was in a floodplain. It's in a uh, and uh, it's full of mosquitoes in this area, right in the middle of a forest. These beautiful trees around us here, and uh, they just came and just put it in. And the only reason that they put it there was because we've got a pump station down there where we've got electricity and water, and they thought that would be the great place to do it. Basically, a shack that was put up. The ants have eaten away at the timber. Um, nothing was finished. Uh, nothing was followed up with. Um, it was just, I guess, an allocation of money that nothing happened. Conservationists fear that even if I4 could overcome the issues of protecting people, the corridor doesn't offer the long-term benefits that regulated hunting tourism does for paying for wildlife. Our question is what is, what is in it for them and what is it long-term? So I guess when you're in a hunting area and you, you're invested in the area, you're protecting it for long-term to continue with it. But a lot of these organizations we see come in and don't do what they say they're going to do long term. It's a temporary thing, maybe to please donors or to for some, some effort like that, but it's not long term. And that's our concern is when does the money run out from that? It's it's often donor money and it's, it's temporary, it's emotional money that's here. But in two, three years time, is it going to be there? And it costs money to protect these areas, to protect the environment. And on hunting with a business model and it's uh, sustainable, you do have that. We have to understand what it's like for the people of Africa. We have to take them into consideration of what it's like for them to live it with these animals that we adore from afar. In some areas they are devastatingly overpopulated. They're destroying habitat, not only for themselves but for other wildlife. You know, other wildlife is just decreasing because there's not the forage there for them. Conservationists say the room to roam plan is flawed because it prioritizes elephants over people. It will make human wildlife conflicts worse, not better. Thanks all who took part in that. Next to the wider world of hunting and shooting films on YouTube, brought to you by James Marchington, it's Hunting YouTube. This is Hunting YouTube, a James to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. First up this week, Python Cowboy is called in to hunt down a 12-foot alligator that's threatening a cattle ranch. They managed to foul hook the creature before shooting it dead. If that sounds brutal, it's a walk in the park compared to this chap hunting a big wild boar in Florida with dogs and getting face to face to finish it off with a spear. Here's a rather more picturesque hunt from New Zealand. The Grundies are in the high country of Canterbury hunting roaring red stags among breathtaking mountain scenery. Close encounter guided predator hunts kick off their spring hunting season in Illinois, calling up this coyote in a textbook setup. Back in the UK, it's a glorious spring morning and Peter Jones of County Deer Stalking guides begin a mow onto his first deer. A couple of walkers interrupt his first stalk, but he finishes up with a nice munchak. Robin Foxer is called out to help with controlling corvids, causing damage on the farm. Despite trouble with misfeeds in his semi-auto, he makes a good bag of 65. TGS Outdoors takes a provocative look at the benefits of semi auto auto shotguns asking why anyone would still shoot an over and under. Is it just clickbait or do they have a point? And finally, the Suffolk and Norfolk Rat Pack have an outstanding morning on a pig farm, killing over 900 rats in a single morning. The video is 16 minutes of non-stop action and there's still parts two and three to come. That's it for this week. We've put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the eye symbol top right or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film you'd like us to pop into the weekly top eight, email charlie the link charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. Well, that's it for this week. If you haven't done so already, please whiz over to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv. You can click the likes there on Facebook and on Instagram. You can follow us on Twitter. You can subscribe to us on YouTube. You can pop your email address to our register page and we'll contact you about this show, Field Sports Britain. It's at 7pm UK time every Wednesday. And this has been Field Sports Britain. Good hunting, good shooting, good fishing and goodbye. <laughs>